I remember watching the highlights of, of a Manchester derby. He's only kicking off in the half stand. And from the age of 10, I just looked at it and thought, I want to be in there. Just the excitement <laughs> yeah. and the madness. Yeah. Straight away, this is where I fit in. Yeah. You know, I just felt like I belonged. I was, I've just become sort of like I went on a violent spree and bang at it out of football. But just, I was getting money from any way sort of like necessary then, do you know what I mean? Calling all favours and doing favours that I probably really shouldn't have been doing. Yeah. So you just at it? Sometimes it just felt like I just pressed that self-destruct button. Nothing, nothing mattered. It was just like I was just a, a downward spiral, and that was like over and over and over again. Did you ever think about taking my life? I didn't want to die. I just wanted that pain to stop right there. Yeah. I could have never dreamt where I am now. I always look back and think that's that's just because you carried on fighting, carried on fighting for another day. Yeah. If there's anyone out there listening to this who's going through the same thing, you've got any one bit of advice for them? Welcome to the show, mate. Thanks, Dodge. Uh, very much looking forward to this one, mate. Yep. Very curious about you. Very curious. Looking forward. Anyway, let's roll back. Uh, where did you grow up and how did you become one of Man City's top boys? Well, I was born in uh, Manchester, a place called Ancoats, which was um, only a mile out of the city centre. Rough, rough, rough area, tough area. Um, born with my mum and dad, they split when I was, um, I was a young age. You know, they were both younger self, teenagers. Um, and one thing led to another. Uh, my mum sort of um, drifted a little bit, drink. Um, my dad was met another partner. My mum did. Um, found myself living with my grandparents back in Ancoats. Um, we moved to nearby Mars Platin when I was about two or three. Mm. Um, so you so you moved into your nan and granddad's house at the age of two, did you? Age of two, yeah. Oh wow, yeah. yeah. And that's because your old your mum was on was. Boozing. Um Well, or... we never really got to the bottom of okay. it as to why. Yeah. Um, she, I know she was in an accident, in a car accident. Yeah. Um, so I went with my nana. Yeah. Um, but one thing led to another. By the age of seven, I was adopted by my nana. And I okay. stayed there. Stayed there throughout my childhood then. Cool. Um, so, so yeah, Mars Platin was, um, as I say, just, just near the city centre. Big Manchester United area. I oh, was it United areas there? Is it? Big Manche- North Manchester. So what big- year? What roughly year are we talking here? Talking in the eighties here. Okay. It's not like I was born eighty three, so we're talking okay. mid mid to late eighties. Yeah. Um, so yeah, growing up was a bit. It was a bit difficult. I was a bit. Um, I was a bit confused. I didn't know where I fitted in. Yeah. Obviously, being with my mum, yeah. you know, for the first few years, then living with my nana. Um, one of my nana's kids, my auntie, that was she was still at home. Um, so yeah, it was a bit difficult, I, you know. Even though I was loved, you know what I mean. It yeah. was, I was I was loved by my nan and my granddad. Um, yeah. It was just something that I, I didn't know where to fit in, and that's probably um, materialised as well throughout, you know, my early years in school and what have you. Mm. Just felt a little bit like I was a bit odd, a bit yeah. different. Didn't know where to fit it in. Yeah. Um, and was that at school you didn't know where you fitted in? Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, at a young age, sort of like definitely through primary school, I was always felt like a little bit odd, you know, a yeah. little bit like the odd one here, and you know. A little bit, probably a little bit of a weirdo, I suppose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, so um, so it was difficult. Um, and then, like I say, my auntie was that home with my nana. She, um, at the time, she was seeing a, she was seeing a guy who was um, a big Man City fan um, from the other side of Manchester. Um, now, there was, some, there was some in me already. You know, I remember putting a pair of socks on. I was like, oh, these are City socks. And I was like, what are you doing about City socks? You know what I mean, it was, everyone was a red. There was yeah. no city fans in the area at yeah. the time. Um, so this must have been like early nineties. Now you're talking like yeah, early nineties. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because everyone was Man United fan back then, wasn't it? Well, everyone, yeah. Half of London was Man United yeah, fans. Yeah, 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 right. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, and it, anyway, he said to me, he said, "If you want to go to City one time, you know, I'll take you to City." Um, so obviously, like you know, took me there. It was all Teddy Centre. It was like the old Kipax. Um, I was age seven. City v Tottenham. Um, and like pff, I was like wow it yeah. was like the airs on the back of my head stood up you know it was all like the surge forward the singing the yeah. togetherness and it was like straight away this is where I fit in yeah. you know I just felt like I belonged yeah. straight away you know everyone was together the singing the chanting um, and it was going back Gazza and Lineker was playing for Tottenham oh were they yeah he was playing for Quality. Tottenham at the time so it's that's how long ago it was yeah, yeah. Um, and from that day onwards, I was I was Madman City, yeah. And what was it like living in Manchester in a in a United area, knowing you're wearing the the light blue? Uh, I stood out in that area. Yeah. Um, 
but obviously going going to main road my side yeah it was like um it's like the opposite end of the city this is yeah. like south manchester you know so this is another rough area tough, you know what i mean it? tough area you know what i mean big big game um, big gang sort of culture yeah. in the area and and but that was a blue area all sort of like south manchester levin june long site there all like south it's like like that was a city area yeah. um so i was going down here you know felt yeah this is it this i belong here you know and it was like it's a different persona it could be someone else yeah. you know fitted in here i loved it you know loved the banter with the lads and you know everything the chanting mm. you know the, the banter with the away fans mm. and um yeah it just something gripped me and it, it, something was lit inside i used me. to love going to main road yeah, yeah as a west ham away fan walking through the streets there because it's just tight isn't it walking yeah. through the streets and you come up a good feeling what yeah. was it like what was it like then going through so what sort of age you said right at seven i said right man city the blue what sort of age were you going right i'm going every week meeting the boys down there and uh, and getting tucked into whatever you were um i'd say from about to be honest with you this might sound a bit mad now yeah. from, from i remember watching the highlights of, of a manchester derby and i was about 10 yeah. and it's, it's only kicking off in the half stand <laughs> and from the age of 10 i just looked at it and i thought i want to be in there <laughs> i wanted to be in there just the excitement and yeah. the madness yeah um so yeah but I've, i'd say around about 14 15 i started noticing who the lads was and um i know all the older lads sort of like trying to get near them singing together yeah. and you want you want to dress like them and what yeah. have you and you know you think you, you know at one age at, at an age i was sort of like looked at them as in, in awe, yeah. sort of like it, as if they were sort of like on par with the players. Yeah, it was um, it was it was a mad time. And when when were the times you were going right? I feel safe at home, but it's different when you go away. Yeah, and well, you all feel safe when you're away because you got probably three hundred, four hundred, who are I don't know how many how many were Man City taking Man City, like hardcore. Yeah, I mean, with City, it could depend. Could you I mean, tell you what three thousand away in a home game, right? Yeah, we take three thousand on home game. Yeah. But how many, yeah, how many when you were growing up and you were seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and you knew you could count on? Um, probably small number. Yeah. Probably, um, I'd say when I was in sort of like in, in our group when we was like the top lads, as you say, um, there was probably there was probably only fifty of us. Yeah. I'd say yeah, there were only fifty of us, and, and out of that fifty, I'd probably say a good you know ten that was like it was down to them really. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I'd say that was probably pretty similar with most of them. Yeah. yeah. Is isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And what was the what was the movement for you then when you was like becoming an adult? Because you couldn't you couldn't be sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen when you go. You know what? I'm actually filling out now. I can handle myself more. Was that was that the times when you knew that you wanted a piece of this every week? Yeah, um, sort of. Obviously, as I got in my teens, um, sort of come out my shell a bit, going to the city and what have you, and started fighting a lot more. Um, and I just sort of thought, yeah, you know what, you know what, I can I can actually handle myself if yeah. I ever go here. And um, yeah, you just get a bit more confident about yourself. Um, and I, but I'd say it was more in my early twenties when um, I started really getting to the forefront of of City's group. Mm. Um, you know, you meet meet people now, and you you know becoming mates with them from all over Manchester. Yeah. Um, and you sort of like develop your own, you know, your own sort of little little group, yeah. little network. Um, and yeah, so and like I say, the away games. Um, it was like excited, you know, you you was there, you were the boys and you was always going either by train or on a coach, you know what I mean? You wanted to park up out of the way and get out of the way and do your own thing and yeah. and it was just yeah, it was a buzz, you was on their manner, you know what I mean? You was on their manner walking about, you know, everyone's looking at you, you know what I mean? And it, it, yeah, it was a good buzz. And how did you feel when you're on someone else's manor when you got a core of maybe three thousand gone up there, you could probably got hundred, hundred, two hundred lads or anything, but you know you could count on fifty. Did you feel invincible? Yeah, def well, yeah. We, we, I mean, we knew it could go pear shape, but yeah. Um, but yeah, you just you just felt like no matter what, you was together. That was it. You know, if one was getting it, we're all getting it. Mm. Yeah. And what was the what was it for you going into other boozers, taking over other boozers? What was the? Yeah, definitely. You know, sometimes we'd get down there, especially like if it was up, up north, and we could get down there early do early doors. Um, give me an example. Give me an example of a club. Give me an example of a city, a club you went to. You know, you know what? We're gonna have a tasty day here. Um. <sighs> Any of the London clubs, really, Tottenham's always like at West Ham. That was another one. Well, Upton Park. Upton Park, yeah, we loved it down there, yeah. Um, you used to get the boozers, the boozer call of Denmark was there. Mm. Not, not far, yeah, just off the mm. station there, yeah. I remember going down there in a the cup game. That was always a tasty day. Yeah. Um, obviously, um, United up the road from us. And, you know, both the Liverpool clubs. Um, but, like, the Yorkshire clubs as well for us, there was always... You what, know, your Leeds? And Leeds, the South Yorkshire clubs, even, you know, like both Sheffields. Yeah. Barnsley, Barnsley was always up for was it. it? Barnsley, yeah, Barnsley, was yeah. It? Them, you know, them, them South Yorkshire clubs, you know, yeah, like the, the old mining little towns and what have you. Yeah, 
had a few like with the South Yorkshire clubs, even really? like the small clubs, yeah, yeah. Like Scunthorpe and what have you, obviously when we was when we was down there, uh, like Scunthorpe and um and Rotherham and what have you, yeah. They was, they was, they was bang up for it, yeah. 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 Mad, isn't it? Because you just think they're smaller clubs, but they're all game as well, aren't they? The smaller clubs, they've got a firm as well. Yeah, it's, it's um, the, the rough towns, the yeah. rough towns and the cities, and like you always find, like it's, it's wherever, wherever the clubs in a rough area, yeah. Like they, they are, they, they, they're mad for it. The game, yeah. yeah. Game and anything. what were you doing? What were you doing in your daytime to earn money? Then what was your job in the daytime um, when you? I was, I was, I was working, used to work on the road, sort of, um, you know, doing it, doing electrics and what have you for the street lighting. Um, and by the, by the age of I think it was about 20, I started working as a doorman as well um, in Manchester Nightlife. So, again, that brought a lot of um, a lot of attention yeah. and, um, and a lot of trouble, yeah. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. So you you not feel like sometimes you're a sitting duck? Do people know like you're one of the top boys of Man City, then you've got United fans turning up or Leeds fans turning up or Liverpool fans turning up and clocking you? Well, no, do you know, no. That, it, never, it never really happened. It was sort of like it was, it was two separate... Two separate worlds for me, really. Yeah. Um, sort of like the door world was. I mean, don't get me wrong. You used to have the lads coming down. You used to have to sit lads a lot coming down. Yeah. Um, you used to let them in. You know what I mean? Let yeah. a few of the lads in. What have you? Um, but it was more um, sort of like you, you, sort of like the underworld. Mm. You know what I mean? That's so. So it was sort of like I had to be a bit switched on. You know what I mean? Away from the football. I mean, these days I'd, I'd have a full day at the football, come back half smashed, and have to get ready and go on the door. And it's like you know, you had to switch on. Yeah. Yeah, and what was that world like in Manchester? Well, you're talking, you're talking probably like late nineties now, are we? Um, in the two thousands. Two thousands. Yeah, okay. sort of like um, early, early to mid two thousands. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what were you getting involved in around that time? Obviously, when you're working on doors, naughty people everywhere. Yeah. It brings you drugs. It brings you violence. It brings everything, women, etc. What was it like for you? Yeah, it was a, um, it was a mad world. Obviously, you know, I was, I was um, at, at this age, just I'd filled out. You know, I was, I was about seventeen stone now. Um, you know, and training, and training, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, could look after myself. Yeah. Um, you know, my reputation at the football and what have you. Um, so as a doorman, like you say, you know, the phone goes and you, and you, and you called on into that world. Even yeah. though I wasn't really in that in that world. Yeah. Um, you end up getting caught up, into. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, you called on for a little bit of muscle. You know. Um, so yeah, it, I, I was called on sometimes yeah. to sort of like get involved in stuff. That was probably a little bit out of my league. Yeah, yeah. I bet it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Give me an example where you'd get called on. Um, so there could be a couple of, um, you know, a couple of gangs feuding and what have you, and, you know, one owes you other money. Um, and, you know, some of the people that we worked for was, you know, involved in that. We'd, we'd be called on, you know, yeah. to, to go and retrieve the debt. Yeah. Um, you know, so we'd have to go to someone's house, kick doors in or, you know, go and get a grip of somebody and and, um, and, and get the debt. Yeah. Get the debt, yeah. And yeah. did you find that a buzz? I'm not going to lie, I did, yeah. yeah. So, so certain parts of it was like, yeah, it was, yeah. So someone's saying to you, and little firm there, go and get um, go and get our money and I'm yeah. going to give you that in with an hour's work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how many years were you on the doors for? On and off, around about 10 years. Yeah. And was it like up in Manchester with the gangs? Um, not as bad as it was in the nineties. I yeah. know in the nineties there was um, there was quite a big a big war over the doors because obviously the money, yeah. you know, like the big clubs like the Hacienda and and um, there was gangs feuding yeah. for for control of the drugs and the doors as well. Yeah. Um, so that had died down a bit. Um, so I was just at the back end of it. Um, yeah. But there was obviously you know still different gangs from different areas. You know, they wanted to come and bowl in the club and yeah. sort of like let their authority be known. Yeah. Um, so it was like um, just sort of like trying to meet in the middle sort of thing. You know, mm. you got to let them have a little bit of their space and what have you and yeah. let them, but obviously not not too far mm. where like you're taking the piss sort mm. of thing. And what was the what was it like in the clubs up there at the time? You're saying Hacienda, that's one of the one of the best clubs in the in the country at the time, right? Yeah, well that that, that had already gone, that had been shut down that in the in the nineties and what well, okay. Yeah, yeah. So um when I first started going out it was like clubs like um Piccadilly Twenty Ones, yeah. um Royals, and there was a club like called Sankeys as well, just up the road, mm. not far from where I was brought up, which ended up working on the door on as well. So mm. um so yeah, there was still like pretty pretty big nightclubs, probably not as not as it was in the nineties though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And for you, were you using a lot of drugs at the time and boozing? Yeah, yeah. From um, 
like I say, I've already spoke about my mum. Um, bruising was um, rife within the family and drug taking. Yeah. Um, obviously, I didn't realise the sort of addictive personality that I had. So I just sort of followed suit. But yeah, I was drinking from an early age, around about 14, going to the football. That's where it, that's where it come with the day at the football, yeah. with boozing. So, you know, I'd finish school on a Friday, go out and have a, have a few with my mates in yeah. the park or whatever. Um, straight back on it on the Saturday, a couple yeah. of cans going down to my side. Yeah. Yeah. Thought nothing of it. And did that lead into doing a load of bugle over the years? Yeah, definitely. Like yeah. you know, um by this time cocaine was big on the scene. Yeah. Um and uh, football, it was football on the doors as well, you know, all the door members that's it. You know, you find someone taking you take it off them and, yeah. and we chair it out. So yeah. um so yeah, nearly every weekend it was it was I was bang at it, yeah. Mm. And how many years? How many years? What are you now? Thirty-seven. 30, Thirty-nine. Thirty-nine. Yep. So we're talking in your twenties now for yeah. a good. How many years were you going to the football and just getting on it and causing trouble and over fifteen years? Fifteen years. Over fifteen years. Home and yeah. away. Home and away. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've I've got a few bands as well in between. A good few. A good few banning orders as well. In oh between, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember your first banning order? Yeah. Do yeah. Where was that? That was a. Um, Bolton Wanderers, Bolton Wanderers. Oh, yeah. Would you get banned for that day? Um, I remember going to it. Was a, it was in the League Cup. We um, what, rough, what year were we talking here? Roughly? Talking here, two thousand and seven, maybe two thousand and eight. Okay. Um, it was an Halloween midweek game. Um, about fifty of us had met in Manchester early doors. It was only at the road Bolton anyway. So, but it was an Halloween. So I think we all robbed a load of Halloween masks on the way up there, <laughs> um, just just to confuse the police. Yeah. So we've got to have to train. It's only a couple of stops. We've got to train all in Halloween masks, walking around Bolton, and all looking for it. The police are all over us then. Um, but yeah, after the game, a bit of scuffling broke out here and there. Obviously got involved. Um, the police got involved. Bit of pushing and shoving. Um, and they was end up yeah arrested for assault arrested for um, assault on the police as well said assaulted the police horse um, you hold on hold on you assaulted how you assault a police horse well, exactly yeah I, you know <laughs> did, did, I think his head was that big <laughs> yeah, got fucking big blinkers on <laughs> but um, I think they were charging me I think I tried to you know push the arse or something yeah. anyway they, they, I think they dropped that in the end but got done for um, got done for assault um, got a three year banning order. for that incident for that incident yeah so when they give you a three year ban order what was it in court fine and then your three years in a three year ban yeah okay what sort of fine was it do you remember i can't remember a couple of hundred quid or so quid, yeah okay yeah and when they say a three year ban or is that home and away every everything every football ground in the country so yeah. how do they know if you put a wig on and something else whether you're in that game or not well they, they, they don't really it's, it's down to a football intelligence at your club um after my first ban i wasn't really on the radar so i was going i was going here there you know um i remember we had stoke not long after in the uh, in an FA Cup game, got told he was coming, so we, we was out. I was out while I was banned. Um, I think we plotted up after the game on the estate. This is at the Etihad. Um, I come out and attacked him. Attacked, attacked their escort, and it was going on, on and off, fighting with each other all the way down to Manchester City Centre for about a good 10, 15 minutes, um, and that's while I was on the ban. Was it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. yeah. So the ban is what was the actual ban? You're not allowed in the stadium. We're not allowed a couple of miles around the stadium. Not allowed within um, one mile of any football ground in England or Wales where Manchester City was playing. Wow. And and England as well. And England as well. And England as well. Yeah. And um, obviously any game abroad, that's on my passport in. So so yeah, <laughs> it's um, more more of, more of a nuisance having to go and sign on every every time. There was, there was a, but at that time, I don't think City was in Europe or anything, no, so okay. it was just the England games, probably more of a Nars now, yeah. it, it, you know, when we played in Europe every other week. So where were you going? Were you travelling away for England games as well? No, no. Just I didn't really get, games? I just, yeah, I went to, I've, I've only been to a few England games, wasn't really big on the England scene, just with, um, so I, I remember, I remember the game against Greece, remember the game against mm. Greece in uh, at Old Trafford? Is that when Beckham, Beckham scored left, the free kick? Free kick yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, I remember being out for that one, I was only young and, um, it was just going off everywhere with England fans like City was fighting Stoke, then he was fighting Oldham, and Derby was down and Preston, and then Everton was fighting United, and it was like wow, you know, they just like oh fight, he just use it as Madness. a free for all to fight each other, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was your what was your movements then? So we're talking like mid two thousands, coming to two thousand ten. How bad did your drinking drugs got at this point? It was bad from from the off really. Didn't you know? 
Um, you say from New York, what sort of age? Just in my late teens. So okay. It was, yeah, it was um, It was never just one night out. Yeah. It was never good enough. It was like the next day, you know, two, three days. And that's, that was from an early age. Um, but you don't really see mm. that it's... You're you in did, it. You're in it. Yeah. It's just... You're enjoying yourself. Yeah. And I was enjoying it. Didn't really have, you know, any um, responsibilities. So it was, it was just, um, just yeah, like the party life. That's how you seen it, and that's how a lot of people seen it. You know, didn't really pick up on that. Yeah. You might have a problem. Yeah. And when was that point? Like you're still living at your nan's house, right? Or I've, you'd moved um, out? I've moved out around about the age of twenty, twenty-one. Yeah. And your nan was your world. She was, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, you know, took me in. and um, From the age of two the age to of 20. Two, yeah, from, wow. yeah, age of two to 20, yeah. Um, and even even after that, you know, I'd had relationship breaks down. I'd always end up back at my nana's. Back at your nana's. Back at my nana's, yeah. The bit, I was in my bedroom there. Even, you know, up to the day what's she passed. What's your nana's name? She was called Elizabeth, but Elizabeth. everyone called her better, yeah. Quality. Better, yeah. Quality. So when you had troubles outside of anything, your safety net was go back to your nana's house. She always had the bedroom there for me. Amazing. Yeah. What a woman. Yeah, definitely. Lovely. So when you were, where, where, where was the point where you, give me an example of how much cocaine you were using to, uh, uh, at the most. At the most? Yeah. Um, God, was, you know, there was, there was some times that I'd be, I'd be getting like quarters and half ounces and going through them in a, you know, in a couple of days. Really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so you were just at it? I was at it, yeah. It was like, sometimes it just felt like I'd just press that self-destruct button. And it was just like, and it was nothing, nothing mattered. It was just like, just a, that, a downward spiral. And yeah. that was like over and over and over again, yeah. over the years, yeah. And what would that be? Would that be like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or would that be Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Most of the time, it would be like from a Friday to a Sunday, Monday. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as it, as it got worse and worse, yeah. it didn't really matter what, what day. It yeah. got, I could start on a Wednesday yeah. or a Tuesday, you know. So on it, a Tuesday, you celebrate something, you've had a good phone call, I'll go and get a cheeky yeah, gram or straight, something, or I'll get yeah, bang on it yeah. again. And that was it, wow. yeah. And it just lasts for days, yeah. 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 When you were when you were going through this, were you going for a relationship with anyone? Did you have kids? What what was what was happening then? Yeah, um, I was in a relationship from the age of 17 up to sort of like my mid-20s. Um, we were part of my first partner. Um, and I had a son with her. Yeah. Um, that that sort of like broke down when I was around about I think sort of like mid to late twenties, um, and then I've just sort of like bounced to and from relationships. Yeah. Ended up getting getting a girl pregnant. Um, when so that was an, another sort of like downward spiral because it, you know she wasn't stable and you know we had a daughter there that I didn't really see, didn't know where she was or anything like that. Mm. Um, so that was always at the back of my mind and just all these things bouncing about and always at the back of your mind. Mm. And when was the point where you're going, you know what, am I going mad? Did you ever lay in bed going, am I going mad right now? Loads of times, it, it, like I say, um, it lasted for years, the, you know, the, the using and drinking. It lasted for years, I was like drifting in and out. Sometimes I thought I was in control, other times it was like, out, it was out of control. Mm. Um, 2008, my, my, my real mum, my, she passed away um, pretty suddenly, really. Um, and that sent me off. That sent me off a bit. Um, so You say you, you say your real mum passed yeah. away in 2008. Yeah. Had you had a relationship with your mum from two to that to that when she passed? Yeah. Um, I didn't really stay with her as much, you know, as much as say I went to stay to see, see my dad. Um, but we did have a relationship. It was, it, it was rocky. She was... Um, the only way I can describe my mum was she was she was like a tortured soul. Um, I remember the phone calls I used to get off her, you know, crying her eyes out, drunk early hours in the morning, and she'd just be begging me for forgiveness. And I'd be like, you know, yeah. what? I didn't get it. I didn't get it. What you know, where she was coming from. Mm. Um, and it's crazy because she, years later after she died, and I found myself in a sort of similar position. Yeah. I've just clicked. I thought, I get it now. I wish yeah. you know. I wish I could go back and sort of like say, you know. You got nothing to be sorry for. I get mm. it. I do get it now. Do you remember the day when she passed in two thousand and eight? And did you go on a bender? Yeah, yeah. I, rem I remember the full weekend because um, it was my nana said, "Have you spoke to your mum? You better go and see her. I don't think she's well." Yeah. Um, she's like old school my nana, you know. When they had the um, a sense that sense yeah, about mate. everything, she knew everything f before it happened. Yeah. So yeah, she went go and see her. I remember going down. She lived. Um, she lived in Old Trafford. Um, 
I remember going down, I remember just walking in and seeing her on the couch and phew, just knew straight away. Mm. Just, she was just, she was just unalive, she was just, she was barely alive. Yeah. I remember I had to pick her up and take her to, um, to Manchester MRI and um, took her in and straight away they just got her straight in. Mm. And that was on the Friday. I got a call back that Friday night. Um, she got put in an induced coma. By the Sunday, she was dead. Mm. Just that quick. Mm. And that was that was the alcohol. Yeah. And um, you know, for anybody normal, that be that be enough to make you stop. Yeah. No, no, it just made me go worse. Did it? Yeah. Just felt like there was um, there was a lot of questions that you know. I didn't get answered that I wanted answered. Probably a lot of bridges that needed to to be rebuilt and um, just obviously didn't get the chance. What would you have want answered? Just basically what you know what what really happened. Um, I never I never never really had a bottle to ask a question. Sort of like you just accept it, don't you? And you know what really happened? Why why was I not? Why did I not live with mum? You know what what really went on? I don't know. I don't know. Mm. You know. And that's still un- unanswered today, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. How does that feel? Um, you know, pretty, quite sad. Quite, um, sort of like, it's always there at the back of your mind, you know, what really went on. Something like you probably never know now. And where's your old man? Yeah, my old man, speak to me old man, you know, see him a lot. I was used to go and stay with my old man. Um, he's, um, he, my old man's a character. Yeah. He, he's a proper character. Um, Probably got a lot of my traits from him. Mm. Yeah, he was um, the old man likes to drink. Um, probably got it a bit more in control than, th- than what I did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was in and out of boozers, causing trouble. <laughs> coming out, come from a big family. There was there was five brothers. Yeah. Um, and there was all up the wall. Yeah. Yeah. And they, he he was definitely probably probably the picking a bunch out of five. Yeah. So so <coughs> rolling on two thousand eight, did you find that you were boozing and taking more and more drugs after your mum's passing? Yeah, kind of hit me, kind of hit me, um, and then split with my partner as well. Mm. No job, ended up back at bananas, um, and then good old Betty, good old Betty, good took old me Betty in, taken again, brilliant, take me in Love again, it. yeah. Love um, it. And then I found that I just, I was, I've just become sort of like I went on a violent spree then. Yeah, bang at it out of football, yeah. but just I was getting money from anyway, sort of like necessary then. Do you know what I mean? Calling all favors and doing favors that I probably really shouldn't have been doing. Yeah. Um, Give me an example. Well, just going, you know, trying to get debts where, yeah. I, you know, I, I wasn't in, no, I, I wasn't in that league to yeah. try, try and get in debts of people, dragging myself into trouble. What I really, really shouldn't have been doing. Mm. Um, you know, I remember one time um, getting into a bit of an argument. You know, having a bit of a fight, knocked the guy out, and I took his wallet off him, mm. and just that, that was just to get a drink. Yeah, and thinking, wow. I remember getting home that night, just. Um, Really, really, you know, when you feel shit about yourself, yeah. just yeah, just just remember sitting there for about an hour and a half, just thinking, wow, just what it's come to, mm. Where, you know, just what it's come to. Where do you reckon you get your anger from? Um, don't know, don't know. Maybe it was a bit of frustration. Could have been sort of like you know, time when I was younger. Really, don't know. I'm not really mm. not looked into it. You know, mm. probably something that I need to sort of have a look at in the mm. future. When was the point when you go, you know what, I'm I'm massively spied out in control, I'm getting into tear-ups. Like you said a minute ago, I might be going out of my league here, I'm a good football when I've got a big crew around me, I can handle myself, I'll be the front man. When was the point when you're going, something's got to give right now, something has got to stop? It was over and over again where I you know, realised that things was getting out of control with myself, the drug taking, spiralling debts, and it was just it was just like a yo-yo, you, you do all right for a bit and then, just kept dragging, getting dragged back in, back in, back in. Um, but the time, I mean, it was time, time again. But I think the time where I really realised, like, this, this is it now, was um, 2018 when my nana passed away. Um, just before it, I was having trouble with with my my relationship. Moved back into that is, um, and I was using Everly then. Um, and obviously, I had my daughter in the back of my mind. By this time, I've, I've got another daughter as well. Mm. Um, I remember her saying something to me. She said, you know, she said, I don't think I'm going to be here much longer. And I sort of like just dismissed it. Yeah. But in the back of my head, I thought, you know, is, is it, you know, is, is she, 
you know, when you've got someone like that to, you know, always rely on, he's always there, but I love him, what have you. And he used to sit up having a drink with my nana. I went to stay with her for about four months mm. um, before, I went, before I went back, mm. back to me, um, to me, to me then wife. Mm. Um, but yeah, she passed away 2018. I was, um, I was there at the bedside and that just, um, a day or two after that, just, phew, someone just went inside me and I just thought, wow, this is it. You know, just felt completely lost and just, drank myself, taking drugs for days and um, my relationship broke down and I had nowhere to go and I ended up squatting back in my Anna's house a, a few weeks later, pretty much homeless um, and I found myself, I mean, just because what happened was my Nana went, crawled up to bed one, you know, just before she passed away, but she went and got in the spare room, which was like my room in my bed and stayed yeah. there um, and then I found myself sleeping in that bed where she died and it just, four months, four months, wow. drinking and using every day, just total craziness in my head. Trying to suppress all the emotions that are happening. Yeah, yeah. just everything. Um, and the more I've done it, the more I wanted to stop, but the more I wanted to stop, the more I was doing it. It yeah. was just like, phew, wow. Did you have tight mates around you, Ant? They were like, hold on a minute, mate, you're spying out of control, I can see what's happening. Did you bloat up? Were you going up to 18 um, stone? Were I'd, you a coke bloke, bloke, what was it? Yeah, well, I'd, like I said, I'd always been bit, pretty big, you know, I was um, 17 stone. Yeah. Um, but round about, pff, let me say, my early 30s, um, stopped training, just went really, really fat, yeah. um, really out of shape. We had ballooned up to 19 stone, Did really, you? really unhealthy, yeah. Using, just eating junk food, yeah. just um, really, really out of shape, unhealthy. Mm. Um, yeah. Dangerously ill, unhealth, mm. unhealthy. And who was around you? Did you have a best mate to go, mate? Um, do you know? Yeah, I mean, I've I've always been good mates with lads from the football. Yeah. Um, I had them around me. Yeah, and pe people were always trying to warn you, but um, they, you know they can't. When 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 you're in that sort of mindset, in that mindset, get out of my way. I'm doing what I want to yeah, do. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, I mean, they can't. You know, they, they couldn't babysit me. You know, mm. they couldn't babysit me. I mean, we had a good, I had a good set of lads. At the football, um, you know, my mate Val, JR, and, and Stay, you know, two lads that passed away, Daniels and Nadia, and what have you, and, and you know, look, there's a few. Um, and we all, we've all had our troubles, you know, we've all had similar yeah. sort of similar sort of vices. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, I just sort of, what happened was I sort of just closed off. Yeah. You just shut off, you know. No one really, I don't think really a lot of people knew where I was at the time, yeah. you know, weren't really answering the phone. I was just sort of like in the, in the days. It's funny, isn't it? They say like how, how cocaine is meant to be like a sociable drug. It gets mm. to a point when you over tip the mark, people are just banging gear at home by themselves and it becomes mm. the most anti-social drug. Yeah. Is that, is that what it was coming for you? For years it was like that. Yeah. It was always, you know, you'd go out and it, it was, um, even even in my twenties, it had ruined the night because we'd be all right, all having a laugh. And then as soon as you have a go, poof, wow, yeah. oh getting off going home yeah. and you just go home just carry on like well, what, what was the point yeah. you know yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's what it does it's um, I, just, I don't think it's a social drug I think it ruins a good night out yeah, yeah. Don't but it's rife around the UK and around the world it's, it is and yeah. it's like you know I mean it's easy for me to sit here now and think why why would you even take it just ruin your night yeah. ruins a good night out yeah makes you talk shit if you if you, you can go, manage you to talk, to, if you manage to talk, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you if you stay till six o'clock in the morning, then you ruin the next two three days. Yeah, chatting yeah. shit, chatting shit. You don't know what day it yeah. is. Just sat in someone's kitchen, you yeah. don't even know. Yeah, <laughs> madness. What's what was the point? Do you remember when it was rock bottom? Your nana Betty passed in two thousand eighteen. You went on a bender, or well, more yeah. of a bender. Yeah, spiraled more out of control for four months. What was the point? You're going. This is the point. I'm either going to die, or I've got to stop. Yeah, well, yeah. It was in that house. Um, you know, I was, I was hearing voices, sort of like, you know, like um, background noise. Could hear people talking. You know, as if it was sort of like in a vault in a pub. Couldn't make out what he was saying. I'm like, I'm fucking hearing things here. Um, and there was a point where I remember being sat on a couch, looking at the window. You know, the blinds were shut, but I was seeing people coming and going. I was seeing, you know, for some reason, I kept seeing like these. The police kept coming, the coppers, I was having a chat with him. My auntie was in the house with me at the same time, you know, she was like, who are you talking to, you know what I mean? I was, I, and then I didn't know what was real and what wasn't for a good few days. And I was like, wow, what's going on? I was, remember, like, just hallucinating. I just thought things was there and he wasn't talking. And I, 
remember like lying in bed like you know fucking days of what's real and what's not like wow this is you know I, I think I'm gonna this is this is gonna be it for me here I think did you ever think about taking your own life when it when it was like that yeah because um obviously that state I was in um you know I'd always I'd had a good relationship with my kids you know always you know you know, you know I've loved my kids always wanted to be around them and what have you and I wasn't able to there I was in no state to um so there was that um the way he was feeling um and I just thought you know I can't do this anymore I can't do it I can't go through this just there was no one really you know like my nana my nana always knew she would have been there you know probably would have sort me down to you know and it was like you're on your own now mate you're you're on your own and mm. um it's time to time to fucking go up yeah um either that or it was I was gonna end it you know just you know looking back I don't I didn't I didn't want to die I just wanted that pain to stop right yeah. there yeah um and yeah I just thought about it thought about it for a, probably a good week you yeah. know what I mean yeah just thought about you know just go and get a couple of bottles of vodka now load of tablets and just 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 end it just end it because wow. you know I just didn't, I didn't see I just didn't see anywhere any way out didn't see any way out at all what was the next steps for you then? Um, after a couple of days of sort of like debating that, um, I just thought, any, you know, it's either sink or swim, sink or swim. Um, and I just Googled on my phone, um, CA meeting. Yeah. And just went, I just thought, you know, just got to get there, just get there now. Went in the CA meeting, you know, it was, it was all over me, I looked rough as anything, you know, there's no life in there. Um, you know, still sweating and, you know, itching, like, you know, like a like a real gearhead, you know, yeah. like, um, and it just listening to everybody and and the stories, I just thought, you know, if you no, know, I can do this, and yeah. if these can do it, there's just a little bit of hope here that I can turn things around. Could you relate to the stories when people was stood up and said, "I'm da da da"? Could you relate to things? Hundred percent. Yeah. I thought, um, I thought he was telling me my life story. I thought, yeah. Wow, like, yeah, I thought, yeah. it's me. You yeah. know, they're talking about me. Yeah. And it's, um, <laughs> yeah, and it's like everything, relate to everything. Mm. Um, and that was that was the thing that gave me the hope, you know, thinking, well, yeah, it took a bit out of everybody's story, everyone's share. Um, and I think that's what the key the key to sort of like recovery is. You just, you know, you relate and, and you realise, no, there is, there is hope. Yeah. There is hope there for you. Mm. And the key to it was just keep going back, keep going back. Yeah, went back. Um, found myself a sponsor, um, and it was at the at this time, you know, I was I was working for um, for a Sikh family up in um, up in Thameside in Manchester, um, driving a truck, and um, they knew what predicament it was in, and they managed to get me a house to rent, um, so I moved straight in, um, and then, you know, the more I stayed clean, and you know, I had my own space, started to see my kids again, went through the twelve steps. You done the twelve step program. Twelve step program, mate, yeah, massive yeah, respect. Yeah, massive respect, yeah. Cheers, don't you? massive yeah. respect mate. Um, and yeah, and it just sort of. I know they say they say you have a spiritual enlightenment when you do your steps. Yeah. Um, and just yeah, I remember coming out after um, after one of, one of my steps from my sponsors, and I just felt like the world has been lifted off my shoulders, you know. Um, and the same when I got in that in that house as well. Um, I remember going to bed one the first time as well and it was a similar sort of feeling but I went to bed in in in, in the new house and I got up the next day there was no hangover there was no craving I just got up and just felt wow you know it's like I've got a new start here you know this this is this it's got to be now it's got to be the start now mm. you know there's no there's no going to be no going back and this is what 2018 2018 yeah just and did you ever use after that or was it a complete stop um it was a complete stop um up until about well done three years just over three years um and i did have a slip last year i had a little slip last year yeah. so you're three years clean from 18 to 21 uh, yeah. 2018 to 2021 yeah. you had yeah. a little slip little slip yeah, yeah how long did it so for the listeners listening out there who can relate to this how long does it take to do this 12 step program and what is the 12 step program um 12 of step, ca which is yeah, Copain anonymous yeah it's, yeah it's the same it's the same principles as alcoholics anonymous yeah. you know um 12 step program um and basically yeah it's um you, you sort of like you, you turn and you turn it over i mean basically when i went and just and you know i listened to him what he said to me he said you know 
there's no human power. You know, you've got no control over it yourself and there's no human power that can make you stop. And it just went, yeah, you know, you're right, there's not. And you just sort of have to turn it over to, yeah. to, to sort of like a God or a universe or what, whatever you believe in. Yeah. You know what I mean? What um, did you believe in? Well, I've, n I've never, ever been religious. Yeah. Um, and I, I probably wasn't really spiritual, but what they said to me said, when when you when you are at your at your wit's end, yeah. you will believe because there's nowhere else to turn. That's right, yeah. There's nowhere else to turn. Um, so yeah, and I did I did sort of believe, you know, at first you know thought you know it's just an higher power. Just yeah. you know, I've always believed there's, there's got to be something, um, whether it's the universe or just something something we we don't even understand. Mm. You no, know? I don't even try and understand it. It's something beyond yeah. human comprehension in it. Which is fine. Let it yeah, be. And let it be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've soon realised after a few months, the, the craving had gone. Yeah, the man. craving had gone and it was like, and strange things, strange things happened to me. Like, you know, after a, a few weeks, I remember um, I remember driving past and it was like, I was driving past an, an house where I used to go and score and the thought kicked in. And now in the past, I've never would have been able to fight that craving. Yeah. I would have been in there, but um, I thought about it. And then all of a sudden I just felt this feeling come over and I felt sick. I thought, oh. And I just had to get home. I felt like I was going to pass out. I had to go home. And as soon as I got home and, and chilled out, the feeling went. And I was like, fucking hell, that was weird. That yeah. was what's just happened. Yeah. You know, and it's sort of like, you know, strange things like that happened. Yeah, yeah really, really strange things like that yeah, happened. Yeah, but they stick in your mind. You go, you know what? I had discipline rather than getting out, going to score a bag. Yeah. I had no. discipline. Well, I, I don't know if it was discipline, that one, or some sort, or of, some sort of intervention, divine yeah. intervention, whatever you want to call it. But some some come over me. Amazing. Yeah. Just out of those twelve step program, is there one step that was really painful for you? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a step where you sort of have to you, you, you look back you look go through your resentments, yeah. you know, people that you've got resentments with, you go through them with your sponsor and and basically it's the problems with yourself, that's where that's where it comes from. Mm. Um and you have to go and sort of make amends. So there's a lot of ex partners and whatever you have to go and make amends with and um, you know, people that want to hear like my nana, you know. She 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 just seen me in a mess. You know what I mean. Yeah. She never really she never gets to see me. She never got to see me sober and living a clean life. Mm. You know. Um, so yeah, they they was you know they was hard. It was hard to sort of like go and you had to go and admit you're wrong. But also as well, it was um, sort of empowering. You know what I mean to go and hold hands up and say you know, sorry, sorry. You know. Mm. What, what Do you have to go back? Because when you're straight and you do the twelve steps and that one step when you've got to go back and go. I was a knobhead then, I was violent then, I was this, or whatever it yeah. may be. When you go back and, do you have to go back and see them face to face and hold your hands up, or do you write them a letter, how does it work? Um, it, it, it depends, it depends obviously. If um, What you've got to do, you've got to make amends without causing them any harm. Or okay. you know, if there's gonna be a bit of an altercation, might be better off just to write them a letter, yeah. or a phone call, or whatever. Um, but yeah, if you're gonna hold, go and hold your hands up, and, and it's not about sort of, Telling them where you think they was wrong, it's just you holding your hands up, yeah. you know. Sorry for my part, sort of thing. Um, but you know, again, as soon as you've done that, a weight, another weight's yeah, lifted mate. off you, yeah. yeah and mate. it's like the more you go through, and it's like phew. so basically, it must be like having a load of bungee cords and someone's yeah. just clipping them, clipping them, clipping them, one. clipping them, freeing you up, exactly. Yeah, and, wow. then, and then and then you get you know, that's powerful, right? You get away, and you're free, powerful, yeah, really powerful. I just, I just want to roll back a bit and. You mentioned the Sikh family. Yeah. I want to give one of them a shout out, but two, how come you went and spoke to them about everything? Um, I was working. For, I was working for the Sikh family, um, and I used to box as well, unlicensed, mm. do, do unlicensed boxing and enough. Obviously, I was, I was, you know, out of shape and what have you. Um, I had a job for them, you know, driving the trucks for them. They had, they had like um, a typical company, an Irish company, um, and they, and they just looked after me, gave me the house, uh, and they just showed me like. Like I loved that, you know. I didn't realize that. Wow, and they, and they did look after me. They did, yeah. you know. They really did look after me. Yeah. What did you say to them? Were you straight with them? Yeah, just like yeah. I mean, they knew when my when my nana died. I mean, at first I, I did. I, I was having time off work here and there, and probably letting them down, you know. But fair play to them. They seen past that. They seen, you know, I wasn't an asshole. You yeah. know, I was having I was having real problems. Yeah. Massive respect to the Sikh. What's the Sikh family's name? Sikh Sings. Sings. Sings, yeah. Gary, Gary Singh and his family, yeah. Mate, massive respect to them for them yeah. clocking it, put you in the house, setting you up, do for you do your twelve step program in that period. Yeah. Did you feel like every day you have to take every day as it comes, right? Yeah, every one day at a time. Be yeah. clean, be clean, yeah. be clean. 
So those three years, how did you feel? Like, how did you feel within those three years, from eighteen to twenty-one? From, um, from 2018 from to 2021. Um, things just, you know, it's funny when 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 you start like doing your steps and you know like, your meetings, they say you know once once you're clean and you, and you get free, you know you have a life beyond your you know your, your imagination. You know what I mean? And you, and um, and it, I didn't really like, to me, it was I just wanted to be sort of like free from that craving, yeah. and and just to be able to see my kids and, and have my kids. Um, I remember the first night where. I mean, my, my lad come and stayed with me first, um, and we sat there sober, you know, having ice cream, and it was like, wow, didn't have much in the house, and it was just like, what a feeling. And I remember my youngest, my youngest come to stay, um, and I just felt wow, well, and I had them both there at this night, and I just got really emotional, yeah. thinking, wow, this, this, this is what, this is what it was for, yeah. you know. Never want, to, never want to go back to that. I know what I mean. Just remember him having him on the couch watching the film. Oh, mate, amazing. Um, and it was like, wow, yes. It's funny, isn't it? Like when you get off booze or you get off drugs or anything, you actually live in the present and the moment, right? Yeah. yeah. And maybe this is the first time, what, you're 39 now, maybe 30, maybe 33, 34, roughly around yeah, that about age. About right 35, now. I think. 35. Was, yeah. And all of a sudden you're living in the present. Yeah. Yeah. What a feeling. And you just, you, you know, you, um, you appreciate what's important to you. Yeah. You know? Your mind's not one. I mean, I was always there for my kids, but I wasn't there. If you know what I mean, there's mm. always your mind's going over. You know, you ate for a drink. You might be already under the influence. You know yeah. what I mean? So even though you are there, mm. you're not really there. Mm. So your get out over the years was to release everything on a Saturday afternoon or a Wednesday night. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Let all the anger out. Of maybe have you ever looked back on the Twisted Program? Maybe abandonment as a kid. Yeah. Or well, any trauma that happened there. Yeah. Maybe. Um, uh, obviously, after that last sort of like an afterthought, maybe maybe that was it. You know, like I say, not knowing where to fit in. Yeah. You know, sort of like f feeling like a bit of a loner, and then to sort of like getting into that into that football mentality yeah. and what have you. Um, I used to think I was just an attention seeker. Yeah. You know, you have to be the maddest one. You have to do the craziest things. Yeah. And was that when you were in the height of being one of the top boys up in Man City? Was it the more crazy things you'd done, the more respect you got? Well, I thought that yeah. at the time, but it probably wasn't, you know. But um, just, but yeah, they're all like, they're all like, let Ant do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you know. And um, do like I said, there was, there was a few who was like, rare, like that, you know, yeah. what I mean, there's a lot of testosterone about. There's probably a lot of personal problems, and we just sort of bounced off each other, yeah, and just just doing like the craziest things, yeah, yeah, you know. Go up. Would you be going to uh, home games tooled up? No, never went. Never went tooled up. Yeah. Um, but don't get me wrong, if you know, if we was in the pub and things come to yeah. hand, yeah, yeah, things was like, you know. Fire extinguisher, ashtray, chair. Exactly, it doesn't yeah. Anymore, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I've been hit with everything. <laughs> <one of them. laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, roll well, up. So, 2021, you'd been f clean for three years. What yeah. made you relapse? Um, I sort of fell back on, um, I was in a relationship, so that, that sort of was split up there. Ate a few personal problems, um, had to move again. And just sort of probably just slipped off a little bit, you know, sank back into sort of like feeling a bit lonely, a bit depressed and what have you. Um, and it was, you know, before I knew it, you know, reaching for a bottle. What, uh, for, a, for a lager or for a short? Uh, it started off with a lager. A couple of lagers. Ended up, yeah, so. and, and it was like, it was just like, that sobriety that didn't even exist. It was like, yeah. wow, it just like, Got through back in time. Nothing had changed. Nothing had changed. Still didn't want to stop. Um, so what triggered that? Something must have triggered you going right. I want my first pint. Um, it was it was probably a build up of everything. Like I say, you know, coming out of relationship and um, you know we had I had um, my daughter that I had not seen. We had a bit of a case with her and what have you. Yeah. Um, and just probably not dealing with not dealing with emotions. Yeah. Not dealing with anything. Keeping things in. Um, and you keep things in it, pff, yeah, so it, it explodes at one point, it explodes, and then yeah. you know, it was all it's always my go to, yeah, my always go to is reaching for a drink, yeah. But that drink, are you one of the are you a dry sniffer or did you lead for a drink then get on the gear? Um, when I was when I was using Everla, yeah, um, I did, I, I went through a, through, a, through a stage where it didn't really matter what, it, whether you had a drink or not, you'd what, get on it, I'd get on it, yeah, wow, yeah, um, oh, sort of. Yeah, just whatever was there, whatever I could get hold of. When you're using of. 21, when you relapsed, did you just use that one time or did that go on for a while? A couple of, few days, say two or three days. Yeah. Yeah. And then how did that make you feel knowing you've 
Um, sort of broke in the three years. Yeah, cycle. well, obviously like, there, was, there, there was the massive come down because obviously I'd been clean yeah. and I was training like anything. You know, I wasn't even um, eating unhealthy, you know, strict diet. Yeah. So my body, like, pff, wow, you know, it's like a big crash. But um, poisoned yeah, your body. It, but, yeah, and I felt yeah. like I'd, you know, let myself down, and yeah. you know, I realised nothing, had, nothing had changed. You've not missed it, and I've not missed yeah. anything. Not missed that feeling one bit. Yeah. You know, f after the first hour. Of maybe a little bit of enjoyment. Yeah, it was just dark, dark, yeah. a dark place again. Yeah, yeah, and that so that must have triggered you go right. I relapsed never again, because well, tell me the period when you're like right. I want to turn into a. I want to start training now because you must have been 28 in. If you go off, off the booze, you're going to shed a load of weight. Yeah, and like amazing Nick right now. So respect to you. Massive respect. Yeah, I see you up training at four in the morning and banging yeah. the gym and everything like that. What was what was the period when you go right? I need a proper goal. Um, it was it was sort of like a few small goals that sort of like led to the big one really. Mm. As soon as um, as soon as I got in the house, you know, and I wasn't boozing, I needed something to sort of channel my energy into. Mm. So started running again. I thought you know after a couple of weeks, I thought I'm going to get back into the boxing. I might give this um, you know the unlicensed boxing another go. Yeah. Went back to my boxing gym, and yeah, got got in you know pretty good shape. There was no booze or anything yeah. involved, so. Um, quickly found that I was, you know, a lot more able, mm. you know, when I'm, when I'm fit and fit, healthy, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to have a few more unlicensed fights. Um, and then just really surprised myself and, and everyone how, how sort of well I'd done yeah. when I was off the booze, yeah. you know. Got got in pretty good nick, you know, we got down to about 14 stone. Yeah. Um, so you jumped from like down from 18, 19 stone down to 14? Down to 14 wow. stone, yeah. Um, and I was, I was doing really well, yeah. And then... Um, Few people said, you know, there's a few people turned over into journeymen from um, from the license sort of scene. So why don't you give it a go? Um, give it a go. What turn pro? Turn pro, yeah. Mm. So we went to the board. Went training up at a professional boxing gym. Um, Kieran Farrell he said, yeah, we'll take you to the board. Um, see how you see how your training goes over the next few months. We went to the board, um, and they just knocked me back. Just knocked me back straight away. So everyone was like, Phew, you know, why did they knock you back? Well, it was, I think it was a mixture of maybe my age, me, me, me experience. You know, I'd have no amateur experience mm. or anything. That's um, the that's the mad thing. You've had no amateur experience. Yeah. You then become a pro boxer. Well, they knocked me back. Yeah. They knocked me back. So um, everyone thought, oh well, you know, you're 35 now. Yeah. Whatever you know, it's the end of the road. Um, this was on the Sunday. By the Friday, I'd been into my mate's amateur gym. Got me um, got carded in the amateurs. I said, right, let's go. I think I was about thirty six and on the went went for boxing amateurs. You know, some of the um, some of the kids on these amateur shows, the mums and dads, the mums and dads was younger than me, mm. and, I, and I was boxing on the same show, so <laughs> it was a bit mad. But good for you, mate. Good yeah. for you. And then, then when did you turn pro? Well, it was COVID hit again, so we, I was, that was like another not back. Mm. Um, my amateur career got cut short. Um, but I carried on training, lost uh, lost even more weight, got really, you know, really bang on. Got um, I got set on on board for me, um, you know, for me, for me nutrition, nutritionist on board. Yeah. Um, start, you know, started training again. Went back to the board, and this time I said, well, what we'll do, we'll come and give you an assessment. Why don't you come and see me spa at the gym with another pro? Done that, accepted me, and then. Got me, got me pro license. Yes, mate. And then uh, made me pro debut at the age of thirty-seven. That's amazing. Yeah. What a story. Yeah. So what's the so when you make your pro debut now, at 30, 37, yeah. thirty-seven. What are the steps for that? Are you can can you work your way up? What weight were you? Can you work your way up and going? You know what? I've got another two years, three years of me. Um. Well, it's sort of obviously with, with my experience. Mm. I was you know I was always it was always going to be a short career. Um, and there was. Again, the experience, it was, you know, I was never going to get that far. But um, I set my goal on maybe an area title. So, big build-up. Obviously, uh, Manchester Evening News had a big story all over the papers and, you know, the limelight a little bit. Big build-up, done loads of tickets, you know, big arena and a big gap, you know, at the Manchester Bowlers. Yeah. Um, I remember, you know, coming out, you know, we had, like, the likes of Crawler and what have you in the changing rooms and stuff like that. Um, I was like, wow. And then come up for my debut, could hear you know my name getting chanted around. You know what I mean? It was like I've done about done over two hundred tickets. It's like a thousand people, all the lights and the cameras. 
I'm like, wow. For me, like for my debut, could hear my name being sung, you know, gets in, and then ended up getting stopped in the first round. Why? I got stopped, got got floored, got up for a count, referee waved it off. No. Didn't think, yeah, so that was another set <laughs> back, Yeah, so all that build up, <laughs> boof, back, boof, back, down. Back, back down to ground, yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's, it was a difficult one to take, but professional boxing, yeah. you know, think of where I just come from. That's it, you know, it was about dusting yourself off and getting getting back on the arse, yeah. as I say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Massive. Yeah. Fair play. Just going back to Man City days, tell me the tell me the story where you try to get a game abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I played Blackburn in the cup. I think Stuart Pace was the manager at the time. They weren't doing too well. Sort of lingering around the relegation zone. Um but we had we had a chance What year of, roughly we took with? I think this was two thousand and seven. Okay. Yeah. Um so yeah. Decided to take a boiler suit to the game, put it on, walking about around Blackburn and Darwin in this boiler suit and acting the goat as you do. Got in the stand and then we were 2 0 down. And I just thought, I'm going to get the match abandoned. So we get, I remember a game in the 90s, City Tottenham, you might remember it at Main Road. Um, it was a similar sort of thing, pitch invasion, um, trying to get the match abandoned. And um, yeah, I decided to do that, but there was only me on the pitch. So, um, Got chased around the pitch. We went and Richard Dunn was the captain at the time. Went and had a little word with Richard Dunn. And um, yeah, I got arrested for that. Got took out the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you run around the pitch? Did you run it in the away end? I ran into the home end. It was at in it, the home it, end. where we was away. We, so it was oh, we went into the Blackburn end. Yeah, well, um, I could hear did you, like did a you get, Did you take a paste in, in there? Took a little bit of a kick in, yeah. Well, what, what happened was I was getting chased. I just remember um, hearing the, the crowd singing, you know, like the Ride Should Be Brown song, you fat bastard. <laughs> Um, so I remember doing the dance, doing the dance a bit, and um, as I ran to the opposite end where the, behind the goal there, um, just remember of getting through things. So I just run and just I just dive straight in. So I cut my legs at it, and yeah, I got a bit of a kick in, and a couple come and grab me out, sort of like rescued me, <laughs> put me in a corner. Um, I was getting pelted with all sorts, lighters and plastic bottles. Of I remember coke. it being all over the papers. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was in the paper. Well, I was in. I remember got to work the next day. So. Got him work and what have you. And um, we went to the cafe for a breakfast and I seen like one of the lads from work and he just looked at me. <coughs> said, you're in the paper. I said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me Man City days, Main Road versus Etihad Stadium. For you, what's better, the Etihad or Main Road? Obviously the football's a lot better these days. Yeah. Um, but for me personally, you couldn't, I know, couldn't beat Main Road. I'd love to go back for one, for one more game. Yeah. Um, it was um, it was just a really old fashioned yeah, in English football mm. ground, you know. Um, all Teddy streets. Yeah. Um, my side was my side was a you know it's a proper run gaff. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and it was it was just um, yeah, you, know, you had the kipaks, you know, and the north stand where I used to sit, just electric. You mm. know what I mean? It was, it was close to the pitch. It was just it was just electric. Yeah. yeah. Loved it there. Yeah. Loved it. Loved everything around the ground there. Yeah. And now you've brought in a load of money. What's it like being a Man City fan back in the day? A bit like West Ham back in the day. It was like we had no money. Yeah. It was hardcore. People loved it. And all of a sudden, Man City got a load of dough. What was that feeling like? Because I remember growing up, Manchester was just Man United. No, you, you, you were like there weren't that many Man City fans. All of a sudden, now it must be fifty-fifty. It's probably more Man City fans up north, isn't it? Um, I think. See, living in Manchester, we. we we always we did have a big following, you know. Yeah. Even when we was down there, we had you know thirty thousand at Main Road. Thirty five, I think the cap th was. Yeah, thirty five, like, yes. Yeah. And it was a sellout most games, yeah. you know. Um, I'm even going away. We was taking three, four thousand yeah. away. So, and I think you know if um, we, we, we was a big club, you know, in in a, in a small pond. We was up, you know, we'd always been there. It just it just fell on hard times. Yeah. Um, but it must have been lovely knowing you got. The rich family come in and go right all of a sudden boom just chuck a load of money at this and all of a sudden you're winning everything with a quality team with quality fan base with a brand new stadium with great facilities that must be a nice feeling yeah i remember when they, when they first took over it was like you know because i, I remember be, i remember you know back in younger days thinking wow you know i just i'd love us to just win yeah an fa cup something just win yeah. an fa cup you know yeah, yeah, yeah. um I remember going in a playoff. That was our only trip to Wembley in my lifetime, mm. you know, to, for the second division playoff. And mm. you know, that was that was that was great. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I remember just thinking, just a league cup or an FA cup. Yeah. Um, so now, 
We're going to throw for every year. Yeah. It's, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's a bit mad. We used to, we used to sort of like take the mick out United, you know, for the tourists and what have you, and, you know, think that, you know, you, you should always win everything. Yeah. And, you know, and it's, I hate to say it, we've sort of turned into them a little bit, you yeah. know what I mean? You see the tourists there, yeah. and it's what comes with success, yeah. I suppose. So we're not that, you know, we're not, we're not the, um, the poor little neighbour anymore, yeah. do you know what I mean? We've, we've sort of like, we've won, we've won a lot of that. On the global we've, map. We've won a lot of that, yeah. yeah. We've won a lot of that, and we've, you know. Would you yeah. take winning the lottery and how it is now versus back in the Divi 1, Divi 2 days at Main Road? You know, it's, it's a tough one, that, because um, I've been there and I've experienced it, yeah. you know what I mean? And uh, them sort of days, I'll never leave me. Mm. Um, but I suppose it, it's sort of like, looking back and living in the past I yeah. suppose isn't it? and you've got to really look to the future in yeah, life haven't you? absolutely um, and all of us go oh it was always better back in the day but really you've got to get a new stadium you've got to get the money in. you've yeah. got to make it commercial yeah, yeah. well that's it it's, um, it's like the old um, you know, the older song isn't it hey, granny always said the old ones was the best mm. you know and, and it's just it's just happy memories yeah happy memories but yeah i mean i'd love to go back for one day yeah. you know just just for one game Same. just for one game go Same. to the you know in the old boozer and yeah and get on, get on that last stand, yeah. yeah. And like you say, you'd probably be the same, yeah. Yeah, Upton Park. Upton Park, yeah. I went there last Great game ground. when, when uh, West Ham, Man United. Yeah. You know, and the game got uh, put back that now, and Man United uh, bus was trying to get through. Yeah, must have been 100,000 yeah. in the streets, West Ham. Yeah. Everyone's throwing things, smashing the bus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Best atmosphere ever. That's 2016. Yeah. Then we moved to London Stadium. It's like, mate, hey, what's going on? Yeah, that's it. You it know? does take, uh, I think it takes, it takes, takes time, though. Yeah, to sort of like. There was a lot of anger. Yeah. I don't know if you had it, but we're going from Main Road to Etihad, but there's a lot of anger from Upton Park going to London Stadium because the fans didn't want it. Apparently it was like there's some sort of uh, questionnaire went round. Apparently all the fans wanted it, but it, well, that didn't happen. Mm. You know, and we got put in the stadium. We kind of got it, but it was difficult. And there was a lot of an there was a lot of anger between the fans as well. There was just a lot of uh, yeah, it was, it was it was different. Yeah, well, like you say, you, you've been in that stadium all them years. Yeah. Seasons to get older, everyone's you know where they sit, yeah. and then you go there, and it's, it's all different. And mixed new up. people, yeah, yeah it's agree. all mixed up. And I think these days now they've just brought like the, the standing back a little bit. Can't in, wait for the standing yeah. comeback. Well, we sit, you've got it to sit at the minute, it's just sort of like standing. How many, how many are standing there then? Just one section of the, behind the goal, yeah, like and the away, the away end as oh, well. Quality. But it, it's you can tell it's added a lot to uh, to the atmosphere, atmosphere. yeah, yeah, you did. definitely. Are there any players you look back on because I remember a player. I can't remember what was his name. I used to watch Man City. Kid Cladzy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable player. Is there any players, or any three players you can remember going, right, I'm going to name you three players who are legends from City days? Definitely Kid Cladzy. Because um, obviously he was there in young age. In fact, I remember he scored, he scored a blinder against West Ham. Yeah. In the cup, yeah. Yeah. I was there at that game, yeah. Um, for me, one of my heroes was um, Andy Morrison, um, centre-back. Just because when we was at our lowest, um, he, he come in. And sort of galvanise the team. There's no messing. Yeah. You know, there's a big, you know, big set lad. No messing about. And um, sort of like switched it, mm. switched it round in that season when we was at our lowest. And probably probably dragged us out of that. Mm. Dragged us out of that sort of division. Mm. Um, and the final one. It's got to be Aguero. Aguero, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Just for that, just for that moment. Just as for well. that moment. Yeah, night three to it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Never see that again. Never, never. And. You've been uh, some. You've been on some journey, mate. Yeah, pal. Absolutely, going from what you've gone through to go through everything to do the twelve-step program to come out now being a pro boxer. You've got massive respect, mate. Yeah, mate. Yeah, massive respect. I really do appreciate you coming on. And if there's anyone out there listening to this who's going through the same thing with the coke and the and the booze, have you got any one bit of advice for them? Just get get the help. Get the help. You know, it's. It's a downward spiral, you know. It's, it'll um, keep coming back, you know, and just go and get the help. It'll be the best thing that you've ever done. Um, and you know, anyone's sort of like down, depressed, you know, wanting to end their life, just you know, just keep fighting another day because you know. I look back now, and if if I did, if I did end it, and then you know, I I got to see where my life would have gone if I just carried on fighting like I did. I could have never dreamt where I am now, yeah. um, and that you know, I always look back and think that's that's just because you carried on fighting, carried yeah, on mate. fighting for another day, yeah. So that's what you've got to do, just 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 get through the day, yeah, carry on, because you never know what's around that corner. Yeah. Lovely. Just before we finish up, and have you got one any last words to say to your Nana Betty? 
just thank you for everything that you've done, you know. Um sort of like made me the man that I am really, you know. Um I know what they're saying, you know, don't make them like they do, like mm. they used to. Amazing. And I've really enjoyed this, mate. Yeah, I thanks for coming stage. down here, yeah, mate. No problem, um, mate been an absolute star your journey mate has been some journey and knowing the nick you're in now to what you were and where you're going in life and you've got f two or three beautiful kids as well yeah keep going yeah thanks a lot dodge you're a gentleman cheers mate good Thank man you. cheers cheers, Anne. Pal. cheers pal.